I'm sure anybody that has called on Christ to be their Savior has gone through a season or a spell, moment, time, where you felt like your relationship with Christ was anything but intimate, may have felt distant, may have started because of something taken away from you, something that came in your life. I can't, I can't go through a list of all of the ways in which sometimes we may feel distant from God or we may feel like our walk with Him is anything but deep or deepening. And sometimes, oftentimes, when we're in those spiritual ruts, we may look back and long for those seasons when we were step for step with the Lord. We may long for those moments when we felt as though He was right with us. And it hurts sometimes. It hurts sometimes when we come to that place where we admit that we're not where we need to be. Where the adventure of faith seems more like work than enjoyment. And we wonder, what do I do? How do I get out of this? It's been said, a rut is a coffin with the ends kicked out. And this morning, this this series that we're beginning today... We're going to be going through the book of Ephesians. It's not a verse by verse through Ephesians, though we will look at the first 14 verses of chapter 1 this morning. My goal is not just to help us identify if we're in a spiritual rut. I hope through God's Word this morning, we may be able to see how to get out of it. How to get back to having that step-for-step walk with Christ. How to get back to that intimacy and depth. How to get back to that adventure that we once had. And there are some of you this morning that may say, Pastor, my walk with Christ is as close, as intimate as it's ever been right now. And I praise God for that. But I hope that your notebook or your Bible will still be marked up this morning. Because there are a lot of us in here who've had close walks with Christ And we have slipped into ruts before. So I hope this morning, even if this is not where you are, you will remember what God's Word says this morning so that when, God forbid, but if you slip into one of those routines or ruts or or lack of intimacy in your walk with Christ, that you might utilize our time together this morning as a tool to be able to help provide freedom for you out of that. The letter to Ephesians is among some people's favorite. It's definitely full. It's theologically rich. It is deep. In fact, this morning we're going through 14 very dense theological truths. We're going to to literally see these inscalable heights that the apostle lays out for these believers. We're going to be able to look to the best of our ability into the immeasurable depths of of God's love and His thoughts towards us. And I believe one of the first steps, one of the first tools that we need to be able to have, one of the greatest truths we need to be able to have in our arsenal as followers of Christ is to know our identity in Him. We need to be able to keep in the forefront of our mind who we are and whose we are. And Paul outlines that, the Apostle Paul outlines that to these believers in Ephesus. He reminds them who they are in Christ. If we are are struggling from a lack of intimacy with Jesus in our day-to-day life, this morning we need to be able to be gripped by that truth as believers of who we are and whose we are. And if you're here and you don't know Christ, you're going to get to see God's amazing thoughts towards you. You're going to get to see all that God has for you in Christ. And I pray by the end of our time this morning, saints will be encouraged and lost will be found by the great and awesome truths of our identity in Christ. This letter was written around A.D. 60 from the Apostle Paul in prison. He's writing to a group of believers in a town of Ephesus on the westernmost side of Turkey today, presently. 
And they were, pardon, my, pardon the crudeness of this, but I don't know another way to describe it, Ephesus was rivaling Corinth for the filth capital of the Roman world. Ephesus was a, a, a port city known for their idolatry, known for their many temples, known for their very lewd acts of worship to those idols and their very lewd and carnal means of sacrifice and worship. So when Paul is writing to these believers, if you want a corresponding reference, a cross-reference, you'll find a lot of how this church was birthed in the 18th and 19th chapter of the book of Acts. And he's writing to them, and in writing to them, he is literally speaking to a group of people that would literally be a flower in a manure pile, okay? That's really how you could look at it spiritually. These people were a spiritual bright spot in the midst of a very dark culture. These people were committed to Christ. They were called out. They were consecrated. This was a body of believers that loved Jesus amidst a culture that was dark and disgusting, morally and spiritually speaking. And amidst all of that that was around them, Paul writes to them to remind them of their identity. The first three chapters in Ephesians are incredibly theological. He tells them what to believe, what to understand, what the truth is. He lays it out for them. And the second half of Ephesians, he teaches them how to apply the truths they've already learned in the earlier part of the letter. This letter was more than likely circulated to other churches in the area so as not to just be for one group. I want you to see, let's read together in sections. I want to read verses 1 through 6 first. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Very typical introduction that Paul is giving to these believers. But he says that they are saints and that they are faithful in Christ. I don't want anybody to mistake this this morning. He's writing to people who have been born again. He's writing to people who have experienced new birth, new life in Jesus. He is writing to people who he believes are sold out, born again believers. And look in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. If we're stopping at verse 6, we're going to see through these 14 verses that they're, they're divided up. We're going to see first that there is a, a role that God the Father is playing. Next, we're going to see that there's a role that God the Son is playing. And lastly, in verses 13 and 14, we're going to see that there's a role that God the Holy Spirit is playing in the lives of those Ephesian believers. And I want you to see first that he talks about God's blessing. And the first thing is this, is that the Father was showing his will through this letter to those believers. So number one this morning is this, the will of the Father. Paul starts this out by saying this, you need to know what God's will is for you. And there are several of these. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. There are a lot of superlatives in that verse, aren't there? Who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He's making sure that they know that even though they're living in a very dark world, even though this journey of faith is hard and even harder, the darker it is around us sometimes, what he is saying is that God willed to bless children. He blessed 
Christians. He delighted not just in saving us, but beyond saving us, the blessing of salvation. He chooses to bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, if I'm in a rut, if my walk, if my intimacy, if my depth of walk with Jesus Christ is hurting, sometimes it's because I don't see or remember or recall or appreciate all of the spiritual blessings that I have from God through Christ. I might not see them all. I might not understand them all. I, I might not be able to really live in all of them because I don't appreciate them. I, I haven't taken the time. To, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's only in glory are we going to be able to understand and fully appreciate all of these spiritual blessings. But what God has given for us, His people down here, is this truth, this awesome truth, this truth that is so magnificent that God in Christ chose to and willed, decided to bless me with all spiritual blessings. So in those seasons when I don't see it, I can know that they're there. In those seasons when I, I can't grab a hold of them, I know they're there. When the, in those seasons when the walk is hard and spiritually speaking it's tough to put one foot in front of the other, I go back to Ephesians 1.3 and I say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed me with all spiritual blessings. If there is a spiritual blessing to be had, it's mine. I have it right now. It's in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It is not just sufficient blessings. This is abundant blessings. I can walk around as a man who is literally walking in the greatest blessings of God because they come from Him, not from my surroundings. I can look at the worst surroundings and say, I am still blessed above all measure. In God, through Christ, in heavenly places, He chose, He willed to bless us. I'm sure you've been blessed by somebody before. I'm sure sometime somebody has done something to you that was an incredible blessing. Maybe it was a word. Maybe it was a gift. Maybe it was an action. And it blessed your heart. You know how you felt. I know how I felt. As great as that made me feel, that blessing was going to pass away. That blessing was only a small picture of all the spiritual blessings that I have from God through Christ in the heavenly places. If you're a Christian, God willed, chose, decided to bless you abundantly. In verse 4 and 5, even as He chose us in Him. This is part of the blessing. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us. For the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Let's take those two words together. Chose us and predestined us. And those are words that sometimes we wrestle with. We believe that we are free will moral agents, but then we come into contact with this word that says we have been predestined. We have been chosen before the foundation of the world. And it, sometimes it, it causes us to ask questions. We have legitimate questions. God, how can I be a free will moral agent and yet still be predestined as a Christian? Does it remove my will? And let me be honest with you. To fully explore this subject requires more time than we have this morning. This is something that we need to be able to set aside some Bible study time and have some discussion about. And I have no intention this morning of trying to dive to the depths of the doctrine of predestination or election with us this morning in this. But what I can tell you is this, several things. First is, I am 
finite. God is infinite. I worship a God that is not bound by time, but I am. And I worship a God who knows everything. So I come to this this morning, remembering that Paul wrote to believers. And he turns to those believers and he says, God did not just make a choice to bless you. God chose you. He chose you to be holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. He predestined you to become sons of his son, to be sons of himself. So I can look at this and I can say, as a believer, God, even if I don't fully understand how that worked, what I can do is turn around and give you praise because I know and you know, and at the core of who we are, every one of us knows this, is that we have an essential human need, an essential human psychological need to be accepted. And that psychological need to be accepted literally echoes our spiritual need to be accepted. And what Paul is saying right here, what God's Word tells us is this. He looks out to those believers and he says, before the world was ever formed, God made a decision and chose you. God accepted you. God loved you before you were ever you. He did that. He initiated that relationship. He chose to love you. I love what Spurgeon says regarding this truth. He says, God had to love me before I was ever formed because we know he wouldn't have now, speaking with tongue in cheek. God had to love me before the foundation of the world because he most definitely wouldn't love me Now, again, please understand that is tongue-in-cheek. I love what D.L. Moody says and how in a very simple way, without being drugged into a deep theological discussion over the doctrine of election, the whosoever wills our free will, he says this, the whosoever wills are the elect, the whosoever wants are the non-elect, the whosoever wills are the elect, and the whosoever wilt, won't, will it. Sharon Lewis, where are you? You just shuddered, didn't you, when I said will it. That ain't right. <laughs> and I know it. Guys, let me tell you something. Let me pause right here. God made a decision. If you're a Christian, what's your identity? My identity is this, is that because of what Christ did and because I responded to what Christ did personally, He chose to bless me in all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And He chose me before the foundation of the world that I would be holy and blameless before Him. And He predestined me to become a son of the Most High God. That's who I am to God. Whether I feel like it, Whether I look like it, I am a child of God, and that's never going to change. The prodigal son, one of the greatest stories, one of the greatest, one one of the greatest stories in my mind in in the New Testament. One of the greatest parables told, Jesus told of, of a father who had two sons. And the youngest son wanted his inheritance, and he came to his father, and he said, Father, give me my inheritance. And he gives him his inheritance, and he goes off into a far country and spends it on riotous living and wastes it. And he finds himself friendless, penniless, in a pig pen, desiring to eat what the pigs ate. Do you remember what the son said? He he realizes when he gets to that place in his life, he realizes how far he's gone. He realizes what he had when he was with his father. And he said this, I will arise and say to my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. One of the great words in that declaration of the son is this, Father. He was addressing his father as Father. It didn't matter where the son went. It didn't matter what he was doing. It didn't matter how low he sunk. He was still his father's 
son. There was no border or boundary or amount of miles or horrific action that that son could take where he would have stopped being the son of his father. And if you are a believer, you are a child of God, and immense blessings have been laid at your feet at the expense of Christ. That's who we are, and that's whose we are, the will of the Father. I want you to see the work of Jesus, the work of the Son. Verse 7, in Him, who is Him? The beloved, we're blessed in Christ. Verse 7, in Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. And in Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of of his will. What was the work of the son? The first one mentioned is redemption. He paid the price. He paid the price for what? For our transgressions. The redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. He became the purchase price for me. Before anything existed, God who knows everything and who knew all of me chose to love me. Chose to offer me immeasurable spiritual blessings. Chose to send His Son to die for the sins that I would commit. To pay the price and the penalty for the wrongs that I had done. And He didn't just redeem me he didn't just forgive me. But verse 8 says that this grace was lavished upon us. You see, this morning we sang a song. And part of the chorus said this. We pour out our praise. Pour out our praise to you. If you think about it, that's how it works. Our worship is a response to who God is. Our praise is a response to what He's done. So what do I do as a believer? When I am gripped with all that has been given me, and all that has been done for me, and all that has been laid to my account, my great privilege is to pour out praise in the best way I possibly can, in like measure, that He first poured grace onto me. It says in verse 11, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined to the purpose of Him who works all things to the counsel of His will. Been given an inheritance. An inheritance is something legally binding because of relationship. Because I am a son, because I have been adopted into the family, because all of the paperwork was taken care of and signed by Jesus, I have an inheritance. An inheritance is something that I will receive in the future, part of those spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So where do we have? What do we have? My walk with Christ is not where it needs to be. Where am I at right now? I'm looking to the Word. And I'm reminded of who I am. I'm reminded of what I have. So today I can look at this and say, God, if my walk with you is not intimate, is not close, it's not because you've distanced yourself, but to know that all of these blessings were given to me before I was ever formed. 
You can't lose them. They're secured. Look at verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. The will of the Father, to bless, to choose, to predestine. The work of the Son, to redeem, to forgive, to lavish, to offer an inheritance. And what's the number three, the witness of the Spirit? I love this. Pause with me for a minute. God's Word outlines salvation so rich and so free. It tells us that it was made possible through Jesus from the foreordained plan of God. And it is this thought is concluded by saying, if that's yours, it's always going to be yours. That you and I are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Think about that for a minute. That all of this good news, I mean all of this is not just true and it didn't just happen before I came into being, but right now at this little moment of time, somewhere between the past, somewhere between this future, in the middle of this little dot, moving along this little time, a little line of time, what I have is the promise that it's never going to be taken away. All of the goodness, all of the greatness. All of the blessings lavished on me, they are mine forever and ever and ever. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee. It's given to me right now as a down payment. That's what that means. This Holy Spirit, when I came to believe and God's Spirit came and dwelt inside of me, I have that Spirit living inside of me as a guarantee of my inheritance. There's more to come. This is just the down payment. <coughs> he, the Spirit, is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Do you think that's some of our problem with our ruts? We're living in the promises today. We don't always see them. Like I said earlier, we don't always appreciate them. Things get dark, things get distant, we get distracted. But what Ephesians says is that we have the promise of the Holy Spirit that has sealed us and has never let us go and will never let us go. Having a fresh relationship with Christ means pausing to realize who I am and whose I am. And realizing all that is mine in Jesus. Let me tell you a quick story. One of my childhood friends in his senior year of high school took a class trip to Worlds of Fun. And he, sent, he told me the name of this student that I've since forgotten. goes along with the gray hair that Austin's going to fix for next week. And he said that when they got to Worlds of Fun on the bus, that when the bus got out, they'd already had the meeting about where they were supposed to meet back and what time they were supposed to meet back. So they get out, of, they get off the bus, they go through the line, they're in Worlds of Fun. Everybody's having fun, riding the rides, eating all the candy, all that stuff. And they realize it's time to go meet back and get ready to get back on the bus to head home. And when they come back, my childhood friend sees another one of his classmates sitting on the bench. 
So he walks over and he sits down beside his friend, classmate. And my friend starts talking about the ride, one particular ride. I can't remember which one it is right now. And he asks his classmate, did you ride that ride? And the kid said, no. He said, why didn't you ride it? That's like the most popular ride here. Do you not like rides? He's like, no, I didn't ride any rides. My friend said, you didn't ride any rides? You didn't do anything? He said, no. He said, I didn't have enough money. Now think about that for a minute. That student went to Worlds of Fun, had a ticket to get in, but in his mind thought he had to have money or some other ticket in order to ride the rides. He didn't realize, nobody told him apparently, that once you get in, you can ride all you want to ride. Now, if you were to ask that kid afterwards, how was your trip to Worlds of Fun? You know what he would have said? It's boring. He would have been the only guy in all the world that would have rated Worlds of Fun one star on Facebook. And you know what? For him, it wasn't fun. It wasn't worlds of fun. It was worlds of boringness and yawn because he wasn't riding the rides, not realizing they were already paid for him. I'm afraid sometimes in our walk with Christ, we forget all that's ours. We forget that that price paid for us was so that you and I could experience the fullness of that relationship with Jesus. So that we can open the book, I don't care what covenant, old or new, we can open God's Word and realize all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. And that you and I can take those promises and live them out and that we can flesh those out and we can live in this adventure of faith, not sitting on the sidelines because we think we have to give something or do something. No, the giving and the doing has been given and done. And it was all through Christ and it's free for us. So as a child of God, knowing my identity, know, knowing who I am and knowing whose I am, I now have this freedom to look out at this dark world and say, you know what? None of the blessings that make me joyful come from you. I can look at this world with a new perspective and know all of the spiritual blessings are mine in heavenly places. I can, I can adore that sweet, sensitive spirit working in my heart and when God's Spirit convicts me, when God's Spirit encourages me, when a moment of peace sweeps across my heart, or when joy lifts me up in a small measure, I can know that's the little down payment on the big that is to come. There is a world waiting for redemption. I can't run the gamuts of an infinite God and know all He's doing. I have a hard enough time looking to see what God has already done, let alone predicting what He's going to do. But this I know, is that God has an adventure of faith for you. He wants us to know and to deepen that knowledge of His Son, Jesus, and to lay claim to every promise. And I know for some of you this morning, it took maybe every bit of faith you could muster to walk in these doors. And I pray that if you've never come to faith in Christ, you would not stop short of walking through the door of salvation. You would say, God, before the foundation of the world has on your mind, I can be accepted today in Jesus. You love me the way I am, and you died for me. That simple truth changes our life. What is our response to our identity in Christ? 
Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.